So I want to talk to you today about the, the, the power and multiplication. Power and multiplication. And if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to two places today, Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 9. Matthew 4 and Luke chapter 9. And I just want to open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you, Lord, that it speaks to us, that it is alive, that it is active, that it is sharper than two, any two-edged sword, and it cuts, cuts to even the division of soul and mind. You show us how to live. You show us how to move forward. And we don't need to walk aimless in these times. But, Lord, that your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. You show us the way to go. You show us where we're at. And you give hope. And so, Father, right now, today, I just release hope into the lives of every person here. In Jesus' name, the hope of your love, the hope of your promises and the plans that you have. In Jesus' name, amen. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to start in Matthew chapter 4. And we're going to start at verse 23. And we have, uh, we have looked at this scripture before, and we have taught on it, and we have looked at what it means how Jesus healed people and how he taught and preached and brought faith. And we've taught that before, and we're going to probably teach that again. But today I want to look at it from a, different, a little bit of a different perspective. It says in verse 23, And Jesus went about all Galilee. Can we do this? Can we just read this together out loud? Let's go. Ready? Go. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought to him all the sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments and those who were demon possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Can we do this real quick? Can we just thank our audiovisual team for their efforts and what they do every week? Can we just thank them for getting these things up on screen and getting things up on the web and making sure people can hear? Even if they're not here, they're listening in. That's so good. Thank you, guys. And so uh, let me read this back to you. It starts, it starts here, and it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee. He went about all Galilee. What I want us to notice here is the progression of Jesus' ministry and, and how it started. See, this is what, what we read, read here is what was happening in Jesus' ministry at that time. That is where it started. And it, it was a powerful ministry, right? We, he went around teaching and preaching the kingdom of the gospel, and, and people were getting healed, right? Demons were being cast out. Jesus' ministry was a powerful ministry. And we see here in chapter 4 where his ministry was at that time. But it didn't stay like this. It didn't stay like this. What we, the way we read about it, even though it was so good, it got even better. And that's what I want to look into. And so we'll notice in verse 23 it says, And Jesus went. Who went? Jesus. Jesus went, right? And Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues. Let me ask you, who was teaching in the synagogues? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. He went about teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Who was preaching? Jesus. Jesus. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Who was doing the healing? Jesus. I'm going to ask a lot of questions today, but that's okay. It's an open screen test. So the answers are going to be right up there. And so please just follow along. So Jesus was doing all these things. And then we look in verse 24, it says, then his fame went through all, throughout all Syria and they brought to him all the sick people. Who did they bring the sick people to? Jesus. Jesus who were afflicted with various diseases and torments and those who were demon possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Who healed them? Jesus. Jesus. Verse 25, great multitudes followed him. Who did they follow? Jesus. Jesus. This is nice. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee, from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. I want you to notice that at this point in Jesus' ministry, all these things were happening by Jesus and through Jesus. At this point in his ministry, he was doing the teaching. He was doing the traveling. He was doing the preaching. He was doing the healing. People were following him. He was the one that was doing the healing, right? At this point in ministry, everything was by Jesus and through Jesus. Now, I want us to look at Luke chapter 9. If you have already turned there, Luke chapter 9, starting at verse 1. 
Jesus, it says, then he, Jesus, called his 12 disciples together and gave them power. Who did he give power to? His disciples. Good. He gave his disciples power. Now, this word power is the same word used in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It's, called, it's the Greek word dunamis. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And so it says he called his 12 disciples together, and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Who did he send? The disciples. And he said to them, take nothing for the journey, neither staffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, nor money, nor money, nor money. You know, I find it very interesting, and this is not where we're going here today, but I find it sometimes very interesting. So I, I, I hear a lot of people that say, I'm called to this, I'm called to this city. And they'll go to that city and they'll be like, okay, so, so where's the budget? Well, there is no budget, Right? And, and, they, and they go, well, I think I'm actually called over here because this, they're offering a full-time job. I've known people that have done those things. And so often, even in ministry, people are led by money. And notice here that when Jesus sent out the disciples, he said, you have no budget. There is no budget. Why? Because God's going to provide for you. How many of you guys know you cannot serve God and money? Did you know that? You can't have it both ways. If you live your life always looking for the highest paying job, you're probably going to miss out on what God has for you. And you're going to be serving money and not the Lord. The Lord has a very clear directive for us. So he says, don't take anything. Why? Because believe in God that he will provide for you and he will do it. You see, people assume that all the time that just because something's not there, it must not be God. People assume, I mean, fill in the blank. Just because the money's not there, it must not be God. Just because the opportunity's not there, it must not be God. Just because that ministry doesn't exist in that church, it must not be God. We assume all the time, and he's saying, no, 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 no. I want to give it to you. It's not there right now, but I want you to come, trust me, position yourself, and I will provide for you. How many of you guys know he gives good gifts? Yeah. He's the giver of good <laughs> gifts. And honestly, the best things in life that you will ever accomplish, the best things in life that you will ever receive will always be from him. Everything else is by your effort. Everything else is by your muscle. And it might be okay sometimes, but you're missing out on the top quality stuff because he wants to give you good gifts. His word says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory. He gives everything that we need. So stop looking to yourself and start looking to him. Okay, you guys need to stop asking questions because that's not even where we're going. Okay? So he says, take nothing for the journey, neither staffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. Notice verse 6. So they, who? The disciples. The disciples departed and went through the towns, I'm sorry. So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. They went through the towns and they took it everywhere. Not just to the corner market, not just to the temple, not just to the church where the believers were, where the audience was already there. They took it to the street. They took it to the grocery store. They took it to the apartment complex. They took it everywhere. Notice the transition that happened here. You see, before all the teaching, the preaching, the healing, it was done by Jesus at one location at one time. And then he gave it to the disciples. He gave them power and authority. And now the preaching and healing is happening all over. You see, sometimes when we think about the ministry of Jesus, we think about the things that he did. But I would argue that perhaps the most effective and most powerful thing that he did was give ministry to everybody else. Yeah. He gave it away. He gave it away. So he sent them out. Now, write the next chapter in Luke chapter 10, verse 1. This is the next chapter. It says, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also. Okay, so we started with Jesus, right? He was doing all the ministry, all the teaching, all the healing, right? We started with one person. Then he got 12 disciples, right? And so now there's 13. And he gave them ministry, right? So now we're at 13 people. And then it says right here in, in verse 1 that he appointed 70 others also. So by my math, that's 83, right? So now there's 83 people 
that Jesus has appointed to preach, to teach, to heal. And so what we need to understand, and this is so key, we need to understand how this gospel that Jesus started, right, that he started preaching this gospel of the kingdom. It was a new thing. People hadn't heard it this way. They hadn't heard it in that way before. And all of a sudden, how this gospel from one person went global and turned into a global movement where billions now profess themselves as Christians and as believers. See, we have to understand how this happened. It happened by the power of the Spirit through multiplication. It happened by the power of the Spirit through multiplication. You see, Jesus didn't keep all the power to himself. Isn't that interesting? A lot of times you're like, oh, it's all about me. I'm the Savior of the world right? But he didn't keep it all to himself. He gave his disciples power and authority, and he gave it to this, these 70 also. And so it says, these things the Lord appointed 70 others also, and he sent them two by two before his face into where? Every city and place where he himself was about to go. He sent them where? Every city and every place. See, Jesus was going from one place to the next place to the next place. He sent these, 80, these 82 everywhere. He sent them everywhere to every city and every place. And I believe what the Lord is saying to us is that now is the time to start taking the ministry of Jesus everywhere. Now is the time to start taking the ministry of Jesus everywhere, to every town, to every place, every neighborhood, every street, every corner, every business. Take it everywhere. It can't be done by one person. Jesus' ministry was only three, three and a half years. He could only accomplish so much. So what did he do? He gave it all away. And he gave them power and authority. How many of you guys know he has given you power and authority? He's given it to us. We have a responsibility here. And so when we're talking about the ministry of Jesus, it's not just supposed to happen to us, but it's supposed to happen through us. Yeah, right. yeah. And that is what makes the church that he builds unstoppable. Because it's not just one man. Everybody that receives Jesus, everybody that receives the fullness of the Spirit, they go out. And they are the church. Oftentimes we think of, you know, yeah, I, I, uh, the church that I go to, you know, I go there most weeks, you know, one to two, or, you know, every, it just depends on my schedule. And I go to church, but that's where I go. And they say that not realizing that they are the church. You have a local body, but you're the church. And we are to go out to every place, to every town, to every city, to every nook and cranny, and do what? Take the ministry of Jesus with us. Why? Because he's given you authority and power. You see, the church is not a building. It's not a campus. It's not a service. It's the body of Christ. You're a part of this thing. In fact, let's do this. Everybody say, I'm a part of this thing. I'm a part of this thing. He is building his unstoppable church, and it happens through power and multiplication. Now, the enemy wants to lie to us and get in our minds, not believing it won't happen for me like it does happen at church or it happens for other people. He lies all the, I can't tell you how many times where people will say, hey, can you pray for me? And I was like, absolutely, I'm going to pray for you. Have you been praying? No. Well, why not? Well, your, your prayers are more effective. I mean, you're a pastor. How many of you guys know we all got the same Holy Spirit? There's no junior Holy Spirits. And I was, watching that, I was watching that kid's video, and I'm like, man, I got to get them to pray over me today. Like, honestly, like, those are power. Because you tell a kid something, they're like, yep, that's just the way it is. Oh, yep, God answers prayers, so uh, I'll pray over you. Yeah, sure. When they pray for healing, how many of you know kids believe it, right? Those are some prayer warriors right there. And so he's saying, you are the church. And the enemy wants to lie to us and to get into our minds and to get us to not believe that I can't, I just can't do this. I, I, don't, I don't have the power. I don't have the authority. I don't have the ability, right? And that's the lie of the adversary. But how many of you guys know it says in John chapter 14, 12, Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you. What does that mean? This is guaranteed. Take it to the bank. Slam dunk, right? Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Amen. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. 
So Jesus, in that statement, he was verifying that the ministry that he delegates to us, the ministry that he has given to you, which is to go out and to be light, the ministry that he has given to you will not be less than his ministry, but it will be the same and greater than his ministry. That's the promise. That's the statement. The works that I do, you will do also, and greater works than these you will do, because I go to the Father. How many of you guys are so glad he's not worried about us outdoing him? Oh, he's not worried about that in the least. And so notice, Jesus multiplied now, verse 2, Luke chapter 10, verse 2, this is the next verse. It says, then he said to, him, said to them, so Jesus said to, to the ones that he appointed, the harvest is truly great. Now, what does Jesus mean when he says the harvest? Is he talking about an apple orchard? No, no, no. What's he talking about? He's talking about people, right? And so he's talking to the ones that he has appointed. He says, listen, the harvest is truly great. What Jesus is saying here is that there are people everywhere that need this ministry. There are people everywhere that need to know the truth that you have. There are people everywhere that you can only reach because I have put my gospel, my unique peace in you. There is something in you that only you can bring to the church. And for you to be silent, everybody misses out. He's saying there is a need here. Every, there are people everywhere that need this ministry. And so he said to them, the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. What does that mean? He's saying there's not enough people that are actually doing it. People everywhere need this. Everywhere need the ministry that you have. They need the gospel that you know. They need the spirit that's inside of you. But the laborers are few. In John chapter 4, it says it like this, Lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white. They're ripe. They're ready for the harvest. The people are ready, and we don't see it. The greatest lie that the adversary will tell you is that you don't really have that many people around that need the ministry of Jesus. You don't have that many people around that are actually ready to believe and to receive the truth that you have. That's a lie. He's saying they're ripe, they're ready. Now is the time. Open your eyes. They are everywhere, and they are ripe. Everybody say they're ripe. It's the time. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I've talked about this, and I, I think I'm talking about it a lot because I love it so much. I'm coaching baseball for both of my sons, and, uh, and so the Lord has really given some good relationships in there, and they have become quick friends. Now, the temptation is, is for me to just always be under the radar, to be kind, to be likable, and to just be a friend. But I, I immediately said, Lord, I don't want just another friend. I want to see people's lives changed. And so, Lord, give me the opportunity. Lord, uh, somebody gets hurt, let me lay hands on them, right? They have to know what I believe and who you are. I can't set, eternities are at stake here. I can't settle for just being a good guy. I can't settle for being a friend. There's a lot of good people that don't know you. I need to be light, and I need to ha have your power, only your power that only you can demonstrate come into, the, into their midst. And so Jesus says, open your eyes, they're everywhere. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. You know, sometimes I think we need to start praying, Lord, would you send me out? Too often we start praying, Lord, we need laborers in the field, so can you just get a bunch of people, and can they just take care of that? In Jesus' name. And we need to start praying, Lord, would you send me? Can I be on this side of the harvest? Can I be on this side of the reaping? Amen? Think about it. Here's the Lord who came down, gave everything to pay for our salvation. He gave it all. He died on the cross, right? He gave his only son. He gave everything. But when he calls us to go, we drag our feet and we'd rather not. I just saw there's, there's this new craze called Pokemon Go. Has there, anybody heard of this? Yeah, okay. Everybody has heard of this. If you've been on social media, I'm sure. And it's this app where you go around and you literally have to travel in real time and go find these Pokemon and you capture them. And you have this collection of Pokemon, okay? And so you have all these things and, and it is going crazy. 
I mean, there's people on the streets. There's like these mobs in cemeteries because that's where a lot of them go. And uh, at churches and all these different places, all these people are going all over. And I saw this, this poster that says, when Pokemon says go, everybody rushes out the door and billions of people are on the streets. But when God's asked us to go, we all just sit around, yeah. right? The laborers are few. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in the category of sitting on my, uh, sitting on my hands. Amen? I want to be in the, the laborer that is sent. How many of you say, I want to be sent by the Lord today? Amen. Amen. He's given you everything you need. He has already given you everything you need. The people that he has put into your life, they were put into your life for a reason. He's strategic. He knows where you are, and he knows who you're with. And he's saying, won't you bring me into that relationship? The harvest is ripe. They're ready. They're ready. Everybody say they're ready. ready. Now jump down to verse 17 in in chapter 10. It says, then the 70, those are the ones Jesus appointed, right? It says, then the 70 returned with what? With joy. He gave them power. He gave them authority. They go out and they start ministering, right? They start doing the ministry of Jesus, teaching the gospel, preaching and healing, casting out demons. And all of a sudden they come back and they're excited. Why? Because the power and authority, the same things that Jesus is doing, they're doing too. And they're like, Lord. Well, it says right here, the 70 returned with joy and saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Why? Because I, Jesus gave them power and authority. Amen. He gave them the ministry. You see, some of you hear this, you're, and you're hearing this message, and you're just like, you know, I don't know if I'm comfortable with this. Or I, I don't know if I have the time for that. I mean, I'm really busy, and I don't, I don't know if I can really go out all the time, right? How many of you guys know that's a lie? And that's the adversary trying to get in your mind. But there are all these reasons in our minds as to why we don't want to do it. But let me tell you, When you take the plunge and you start ministering Jesus, there will never be anything more fulfilling or more rewarding in your life because you're going to begin to see people freed. You're going to start seeing people delivered. And let me tell you, when you start ministering to people and all of a sudden you start seeing lives changed because you brought Jesus to them, how many of you guys know you're going to get excited about that? You're going to be full of joy. And all of a sudden, you're doing the same things that you were doing, but now you're seeing lives change and everything's different. Why? Because you're walking in the purpose that he has prepared for you. He's saying, go into all the world, preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons, bring my ministry to the people in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And so that's what these 70 70 were doing. They were excited because it was worked for Jesus. He gave them power and authority, and it was working for them. And so they returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. What does that mean? He's saying, I have given you authority. You don't need to be afraid. I've seen all this coming. I've given you the power and the authority. I've given you everything you need. You don't need to walk in fear. You don't need to be trembling. You don't need to be ashamed. I have put my gospel in you. Now take it to the world. You see, we need laborers because the harvest is ripe. We need laborers out there. But how many of you guys know we don't want the laborers out there if they're not filled with the Holy Spirit? Because it's not enough to just go out with a story. It's not enough to just go out and try to be nice and to do kind things. There's a lot of churches that will preach that. It's not enough. He said, don't you leave Jerusalem until you receive the promise and you receive the power of the Holy Spirit because my story isn't enough. You are meant to go out with power. And that's why we're here today, to get trained, to get equipped, to get the things that we need so that we can go out and minister according to what he's asked, full of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. 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 (laughs) We need laborers that have an understanding of the gospel of Jesus, and we need to disciple people before we send them out. Listen, this is why we do things like Operation Solid Lives. This is why we have our discipleship programs. Level two specifically addresses this very thing about being filled with the Spirit and walking in the power and the fullness of the Spirit. 
That's just one of the things. And we talk about it a lot. But there's a lot of things. Listen, we believe that the Lord has called our church to be a training and sending church. That means you don't just get to come here and be trained and soak up a lot of good knowledge and hear some preaching and get to just enjoy the worship. Okay? That's not what this church is for. We are to be trained and equipped and what? Sent. Why? Because the harvest is plentiful. We have a part in this. We're active here. We got things to do. The Lord's coming back. And we got to be diligent in what he's called us to do. And so we come together for training and equipping, but then we go out and we minister. How many of you guys are feeling, get, start feeling like you're getting trained and equipped today? You getting a little bit of training, a little bit of equipping, right? We getting some of that? You should be. And so in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2, this is Paul. He's writing to Timothy. Notice what he says. He says, the things that you have heard from me. So Paul is saying, listen, I have already taught you things. He says, the things that you have taught, heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So what's he saying here? He's saying, listen, I have taught you things. Now you go teach them things, and they're going to teach people those things. What is that? Multiplication. You see, the gospel is meant to be powerful and multiplied. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 says, And he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Now, I will say this. The equipping of the saints includes the power of the Holy Spirit. We are going to do that. We are going to preach that. And we are going to believe for that. And so for the equipping of the saints. But I want you to notice that he didn't give apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to do the work of the ministry. He gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry. There's an equipping that's supposed to happen in fellowship. There's an equipping that's to happen at church where everybody's using their gifts, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, to gather the saints, to equip, to get refreshed, to get a word from the Lord, to get direction, and then what? To go out and to be sent. Everybody in the body of Christ is called to do the work of the ministry. Yeah, that's right. Everyone is called to do the work. And when you're sent out, you are sent out with the same power that Jesus had. Amen. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? Yeah, that's right. yeah. I'm not, I, I just want to make sure we're on the same page here. So I, I, I recently, uh, in, in our Operation Solid Lives, there's this, there's this section called T for T. And nobody knew what that was, okay? And we were like, we don't really know what this was. It had something to do with testimonies. So we looked into it. And the way it started, T4T for T stands, uh, it stands for training for teachers, training for teachers. And it started with this couple in Asia who had felt like they were to develop this thing called T4T, for T, training for teachers. And they went to China. And what they would do is they would teach people how to share their testimony to receive Jesus, but then how to share their testimony. And so what they did is they started with 11 people. They got 11 disciples and they taught them, this is, this, is, this is the gospel. They got them baptized, right? They got them saved. And they said, this is how you share your testimony. And when they receive Jesus, this is how you teach them to share their testimony. In 10 years, 1.7 million people were baptized in water through that T4T ministry. What is that? Multiplication. It started, went from 2 to 11 to 1.7 million. That's the power of the Spirit. Isn't that true? That's the power of the Spirit. You see, you don't have to be afraid because if you give the power of the Holy Spirit to people and just train them and teach them that the same Holy Spirit that is in you, that was in the ministry of Jesus, people will rise up, they'll start believing it, and the Lord will start demonstrating and doing some amazing things. We got to stop preaching light gospels. Do better. Try harder. You're okay. You'll be fine. He'll get you through. Everything happens for a reason. Come on, guys. He's got something for you. Now's the time. You see, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to walk in doubt because the same power of the Holy Spirit is in you. And if he's in you, he will do the same works through you that he did through Jesus. Now is the time to step out. Now is the time. You guys sensing this? Are you guys, is this, is this resonating in your spirits? Okay. 
All right. I want to, I want to just, we're going to, we're going to close with this, but I want to run through a few things in Acts. And so if you have your Bibles, let's turn there and you can just, if you have a pen, just write down these numbers in there. Um, we're going to just look at the power of multiplication here. So Acts chapter one, and, I, and it says in verse four, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the father, which was the Holy spirit. And then verse eight, it, he says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you sh shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Okay? And so Jesus is saying there is a promise coming. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit, and you will receive power when you receive my Spirit. Now jump to verse 15. It says, and in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number and names of them was about 120. So let me ask you, how many people were there waiting for the power of the Holy Spirit? 100, 120. Can we, let's answer that together. How many people were in that room waiting for the power of the Holy Spirit? 120. 120. Okay, I want us to say these numbers because I want, we're going we're gonna to move into something here. Okay, now we go to Acts chapter 2, verse 4. It says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Let me ask you, how many people were filled with the Holy Spirit? Very good. You guys are clever. But how many number-wise were actually filled with the Holy Spirit? 120. 120 were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then in verse, 44, uh, verse 41, we, see, we know that Peter gets up and he begins to preach. And it says, Then those who gladly received his word, they were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Okay, so what's our number at right now? Yes, our teacher got it. 3,120 people, okay? What is that? That's power and multiplication. They had waited for the promise of the power of the Holy Spirit, and they went out, and the Lord added to their numbers, okay? There was multiplication. And so we are now at 3,120 people by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus, at this point, he had left. He had left. His personal ministry was over, and now instead of Jesus just having delegated power, he tells them, wait to be filled with the Holy Spirit and then go out. And so they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They go out and it starts with 120 people. The first day, by the power of the Holy Spirit, 3,000 people were added. Whoo-wee. So 3,120. Now we go to verse 46. It says, so continuing daily with one accord. How are they continuing? Daily. One accord. They were in unity. We talked about that last week. Continuing daily with one accord in the temple. Let's just say at church. They're in one accord at church. And breaking bread from house to house. Notice they didn't just go home and turn on Netflix and go get dinner. No, no, no. They were breaking bread from house to house. They were doing ministry at their home. And breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So we're at 3,120, and now they're going about, and they came to the temple. Now they're going house to house, doing ministry. And what's happening? The Lord is adding to their number every day. That's the power of the Holy Spirit working, isn't it? Amen. Amen. Now we get to chapter 4, verse 4. It says, however, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Okay, we're in four chapters, and there's 5,000 just men. Just men. That doesn't even count the women and the children. So let's just say, usually there's more women in church than there are men. And I would say that's probably even true back then. There's something about those women, man. They're just, they're on fire. So well, there's 5,000 men, and let's just say, for equality's sake, there's 5,000 women. That's 10,000, right? And they were probably having more kids than most people have nowadays, but let's just be generous and conservative and say there's 2,000 kids. That's 12,000 people. Started from 12, went to 80, 83. I'm trying to get the numbers back in my head. <laughs> went to the 120 in the upper room, 3,000. And now here we are, about 12,000 people in the church. So they started at 120, and now they're likely well over 12,000 people. Now listen, ver chapter 6, verse 2. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It's not desirable that we, we should leave the word of God and serve tables. 
Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. I think that that is so interesting. They didn't want to serve tables, so they said, go find people full of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> to serve tables? Yep. Because everything we do has to be full of the Holy Spirit. Everything we have to be, do has to be filled with power. And Stephen ended up being one of those people, right? Miracles, signs, and wonders, tremendous things. And he was a server of a table. Just an interesting point. Okay. Then in verse 7, it says, Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And so we see in chapter 4 that there were about 12,000 people, and now we're in chapter 6, and they get some other people involved, they release some ministry, and now the number of disciples is not just adding, it is being multiplied. It's multiplying. I mean, if you just take 12,000 and just say, let's just say it was multiplied by two, it doubled. That's 24,000. Multiply by three, 36,000. Multiply by four, 48,000 added to the church. Why? Because of the power of the Holy Spirit and multiplication. Everybody was a part of this thing. Everybody brought their part. Everybody brought their share. Are you guys seeing where we're going? You guys seeing what the Holy Spirit's saying to us today? That's the multiplication of the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus started this. This is what Jesus trained his disciples to do. And he's saying, don't keep ministry for yourself. Don't be the one that has to baptize all the people. Don't be the one that has to go out and preach, be the only one that preaches the gospel. We don't need any celebrity pastors here. What we need is a body of Christ that rises up and steps in and becomes the church that I've always dreamed about, where everybody's a minister, where everybody is ministering and bringing the power of the Spirit. Don't keep ministry to yourself, but get people out there and start ministering where? Everywhere. Get out there and start ministering everywhere. Why? Because that's how we're going to reach the harvest. That's the only way we can do it. And so we come here to church. We come to be equipped. We come here to be directed, to hear the word of the Lord. We come here to get refreshed. We come together in an atmosphere of the power and the presence of God, an atmosphere of faith to receive. But then what happens? We go out. We go out. None of you are going to be staying here. <laughs> Unless you have like a five-night stay that, I, that, that nobody knows about. But none of you are going to be staying here tonight. We are all meant to go out. We can't allow ourselves to just come in, sit, and enjoy. We're not going to be that church. We have to go out. Jesus gave us very specific instructions as to how we're going about it. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. How many of you guys remember when Jesus said, go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you. I'm going to have the worship team come out. When Jesus gave this great commission, when he says, go into all the world, preach the gospel, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, who was he talking to? He was talking to the 120. He was talking to 120 of the followers. And these 120 people responded to the call that Jesus gave them. And what happened? It was backed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And they saw multiplication. You know, we talked last week about how it's not all about the numbers. We know that. It's not all about the numbers. It's about the people. And if you count people, they're numbers. And clearly the Bible has no problem with counting people because they counted them every time. I joked about it last week, but there's a whole Bible called numbers in the Bible. So God clearly has nothing against it, right? This is the power of the Spirit and multiplication. There are people in your lives that need the truth, that need the Spirit that's inside of you. And we can't go and just be like, well, I just want to ease into that relationship. I just want to, you know, just be kind and just be courteous and respect where they're at. How many of you guys know the adversary is using that to not get the gospel out there? I tell you, the people in Wisconsin, and I've, I've traveled a lot, I've been to a lot of different churches around the nation, and people in Wisconsin, they're some of the most nicest, kindest, courteous, but it's also very, whatever's good for you, I'm not going to step on your toes. How many of you guys know the adversary will use that courteous courtesy and never get the truth out there? He's calling us to be bold. He's calling us to be brave, to go into all the world, full of the power of the Holy Spirit, and what? 
make disciples. Why? Because those disciples, they're going to make disciples. Why? Because those disciples, they're going to make disciples. It's the power and multiplication that he uses to build his unstoppable church. I believe that in this time, he is raising up an unstoppable church, a church full of his Holy Spirit, a church where everybody is ministering, a church where everybody brings their part. And it's not one location, it's many places, it's everywhere. We're not just gonna build this big old, no, 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 no. I want, we wanna see churches everywhere. One of the things that the Lord spoke to us, and I'm just gonna share this because I know it's the Lord, is that we are to be a training and sending church, but we're also to be a resourcing church. We believe that we can have, that we could support where we're at right now. We could serve, we could support 10 other churches right now. We could start them. We can get them where? All throughout the town, all throughout the city, because we need to get the gospel out there. There's things that he wants to do. Now is the time. Lives are at stake. Eternities are at stake. And I don't know about you, but we are going to keep going until everyone knows the name of Jesus Christ. We're going to keep going until everybody knows the life that's available to them. When people are freed, when people are healed, when people receive salvation. It's not about business as usual anymore. How many of you are glad and would say, man, I'm so glad that the people before me didn't stop before I received? How many of you are glad that they kept going? They kept reaching out. They kept praying. They kept pressing for you to receive life. It cannot stop with you. It has to go on and on and on. Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful. I would ask you, are you ready? Will you be sent? Will you go out there? Will you be there this week and have the conversations? And just every time, just say, you don't need to conjure anything. You don't need to make stuff up. You don't need to just go out and just start, take a Bible and smack them in the face. That's not what we're talking about here. We're saying, Jesus, I believe that you have this relationship in my life for a reason. Would you come and demonstrate yourself in that relationship this week? I'm going to see him on Thursday. We're going to have lunch. We have this group lunch every week and we read a book. When I'm reading that, give me a word. Show me a demonstration. Show your power. Extend your hand and demonstrate yourself. Why? So that lives can be changed. Because I'm living on assignment. I'm living on a mission. I am living sent. Some of you have bought into lies that says I can't do it, that I'm not good enough, that I don't have time. Some of you, he's already told you, you're going to be starting a church. We want to see that church happen. I'm not even just talking to one. I'm talking to many people. I believe there are churches in this room. And it doesn't need to just be about building one place. That is ineffective. Jesus multiplied. He gave away ministry. And it started a movement that is going, that is faster. It is faster growing than any other movement to this day by the power of the Holy Spirit. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It doesn't matter how dark it gets. It doesn't matter what comes against. It doesn't matter what you hear on the news. It doesn't matter what the analysts say. It doesn't matter who the president is. I will build my church. How many of you are glad he's building the church? Whew, I can't do it, but he can. <laughs>